Um, we're going to continue with order statistics. We worked through a result last time. I think there was some notational problems in what I wrote down. I think I had the wrong argument in the right hand side. It's X. So whatever I wrote down, somebody pointed it out to me at the end of the class. This is the correct result. And so um, if you have IID observations coming from some density and I want to know what's the distribution of the biggest thing, you kind of have an idea that if I kept going out into the population, I resample and things. The biggest thing would be probably somewhere around here. So over on the right hand side. The biggest thing out of n samples, if n was large, wouldn't be over here. So, but there's some probability of getting things over here. My minimum is going to be over on the left hand side, and my right hand side is going to comprise the maximum. And so if I just kept redoing this over and over again, n samples, here's my n biggest thing, I do it again, I get n samples, and let's say my and biggest thing, it's not exactly that point, maybe it's somewhere else, maybe right there. And then I do it again, I collect n samples, and then my biggest thing is over here. And it's gonna keep being something like that. And there's gonna be a whole bunch of points over here. If I kept plotting that n biggest thing, I'd get some other distribution. And so, sorry, my area and my scale doesn't look very good there. It should be a distribution, so it should add up to one in this where that's less scale. So this would get peakier and peakier. If n were bigger, it would be farther and farther to the right. And so uh, basically what we're just saying is we're looking at the probability that all xi's are less than some value I'm calling that x. So the probability all my xi's are less than x, or i goes from 1 to n. What's the probability that one thing is less than x for my IID observations, it's that thing right there. So what I would get when I integrate it, f of x, and I'll be specific about the random variable, I'm going to call that x dx, and I would go from negative infinity to x right there. So that was my notational um, issue. I'm going to write it out like this quite often and not use another argument right here, but keep in mind, that's a specific there, value right there. And so, in calculus class, they may have marked you off if you use the same variable right there. Uh, but we're going to do what everybody else does. Poker? Oh, sorry. Was, that? was it that? Yeah. So, you, you probably want to do something like this. Make this like, this would be the easiest way to fix it, is change that variable yeah. right there. It could be anything. So, sometimes I like this variable. So integrate with respect to whatever. It's just an argument that I'm plugging into this thing. And there's going to be no happy faces over on the left-hand side because I've integrated on the through, but then I evaluated this at x. So this is supposed to represent my random variable. That's the space it lives in. And sometimes we'll give f a name so that we're not calling all f the same f. Please. It's arbitrary. You pick. You choose which one you want to do. So this is the value that I'm integrating up to. So I want to know, in terms of my max distribution, um, this thing right here, this value is just, let's just say there's an x right here. It's that area. Same thing you always do. So I'm integrating up to some point x. Some people get confused over what the, all the little variables are doing. So these are instances. That's the random variable, the space in which it lives. And this is the point on the curve. So they all look like x's. They all mean slightly different things. I'm usually not too specific about the random variable or the space we live in. Um, but I think anybody that's taken a real analysis class or a measure theory class might say, that's oh, really important to define that. So we would be really clear about it. So in this lecture, I'm going to be really clear, and I'm going to distinguish things like the original random variable and then the random variable pertaining to the order stack itself. And so while I'm writing down f all the time, they're not the same s if the subscript is different. So, we work through this intuitively. 
we understood for the match to be less than some value, all of the things needed to be less than that value, they're all IID. So I just product this up and months. So that's the end things, all. This is I go from, well, I guess I wrote it down, I go from one to n. So there's n things, and that's why we get this power up. When I want to find the density, I just take the derivative of this thing. And so in that, so pull down your exponent, decrement your exponent, and let's apply the chain rule to the cumulative distribution. So fundamental theorem of calculus, I'll just go back to the original thing. So full results. Um, I want to take this a little bit further, and I want to talk about arbitrary order stats. So what I really want to do is I want to build up a formula for us. So we want to know what's something like this, x, j, where that's the j order stat. And I might want to know this. What's the cumulative for the j order stat? So we might want to know things like this as well. So this will be next time. Next time we'll learn a formula specific to joint order stats. X, I'll say I, and X, J. So, and I'll plug in two um, dummy variables right here. X and Y, for no reason other than they're the first letters that came to my mind. So, we might want to know the cumulative distribution as well for these sort of things. Um, the formula for this is pretty hairy, I would say, but there's easy ways to remember it. If you understand where it comes from, that's probably the best way to remember it. So I'm going to be a little bit pedantic, work through this in an example, then I'm going to make it more general, and then I'm going to generalize even further, and I'm going to write down these distributions. And then next time I'll come back, I'll try to justify the general distributions, and then we'll move to the joint order step. Um, I'll show you all my tricks. Anyway, um, here's an example. Let's just play around with it and see if we can understand what the basis for the more general formulas are. So I always like to start with an example before I generalize. So let's consider this distribution, xi, are going to be iib from some density. And my density function looks like this. And I define where my distribution lives. It lives between 0 and 2. And you would want to check real quickly is the cumulative evaluated over an infinity? Is it one? And it is. So, what's the name of this distribution? Anybody know? Okay. You ever seen it? What's that? Yeah, I always get people on this. Thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> so it looks like a cumulative for a uniform, but this is not a uniform distribution. But usually somebody says that's uniform because the cumulatives for uniforms look something like this, a linear function. This is the density itself. There's no name for this distribution. I just made it up. So <laughs> thanks for taking the bait. Um, it's not uniform. <laughs> but I do hear that quite often. Kind of like just jumps out at you if you're familiar with uniforms CDFs. This is the density function. So I'm drawing values between 0 and 2. So um, I'm going to get some number of values. I'll just to mark them. Let's say I get six values. One, two, I'll probably get more over here. And we start drawing things in at the left. But there's not a lot of mass over on the left hand side compared to the right. And so my values are actually probably going to be bunched over here a little bit. Maybe I have a value there, and maybe there's one here. Maybe I've got one here, maybe I've got another one. Okay, so um, one, two, three, four, five, and six, something like that. Um, I'm going to sample six times. We'll just work through this specifically. And so this would be my maximum right over here. And I expect my maxes to be bunched over towards two, you know, not real close to zero just because I'm putting so much weight on the right-hand side. Let's just be a little bit more specific, or more, um, well, less general. And let's just answer this question. We'll come back around to answering these in just a moment. So what's 
let's just do something real specific. The probability that x5, my fifth value, out of n draws is less than or equal to 1. Do you think this is a big number or a small number? Think about what this distribution looks like. So we can kind of like have a sense before we start doing any calculations. My distribution looks like this. 2, this is 0. Small number? Yeah, it's totally small. So 1 is going to be over here. So it's very unlikely that I'm going to have five things over here and only one thing over here or six things over here. So to have the probability that x5 is less than 1, there's two scenarios where this could happen. So scenario 1 is going to be one, two, three, four, five things are over here, and one thing is over there. So five things. Or, I could have had this scenario. Two. There's my one again. So I could have had six things over here. It's already drawn them so uniformly, I just can't help myself. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. But I'm just trying to demark that there are six things. And zero things here. Just to disambiguate all of this, this scenario right here, where I had my one right here, and I ended up having let's say four things over here, and two things over here. This would not be an instance where the fifth largest thing is less than one. This is an instance where the fifth largest thing is greater than one. And so I'm looking for, if I repeated the sampling over and over again, I'm looking for this case or this case to answer that, and not this case. So that wouldn't apply. So I need either five things to the left of one, or I need six things to the left of one for the fifth thing to be less than or equal to one. I can't have four things to the left of one and two things to the greater of one, because that's not an event where the fifth thing is less than one. Um, I've written a simulation just to kind of simulate this for us. We can kind of look at it and try to just look at what this um, answer might look like. What I'm going to do is just kind of perform a simulation study like I've talked to you about. I'm going to go back out into the population. I'm going to resample six things over and over and over again. So I've written a function, order stat generated. It takes in n, it takes in j. j is going to be my the order stat that I'm looking at. So for this problem, n is going to be 6 and j is going to be 5. So I'm going to go back out into the population 100 times. And I'm going to sample from that distribution six times, every single time. And I do that with this line of code. So it says x is the square root of four times rand, one to n. So rand is the uniform random number generator. So I'm generating six random numbers, uniformly distributed. And then I'm transforming. And I'm saying that once I do this transformation, they come from this triangular looking distribution. Can somebody tell me what I just did? Inverse CDF. It's the inverse CDF. So this is inverse CDF sampling. There's some problems in the book on this. But what you can do is you can always write down um, f of x. I've got its density function. If I can write down the CDF, and I'll do the same sort of thing that I did before go from 0 to 1. I'll just say to x if you'd like. If you don't like this, you can plug in a different value. I'm going to continue to do this. It used to drive my calculus TA crazy. So it's not a big deal. But if you want to change that to happy face because this makes you sad, you can do it. <laughs> That's fx right here. So this is just 1 half x. If it goes in here, I can integrate that pretty easily. 
So up my exponent by one, divide by my new exponent. And so this is gonna look like one half, up my exponent by one, divide by my new exponent. And then I'm gonna have to evaluate the balance. So this is gonna be x squared over four. A lot of x's going on, they do mean two different things when I write it down like that. Let's get over it. So that I don't recycle all my letters. Again, maybe that's a happy case in there that I'm plugging in and substituting. But this is my cumulative distribution. And so it turns out, if you want to invert something and evaluate it in a uniform, so F inverse, X, is going to be square root four times X. So that's the inverse function for this. If you want to verify it, plug this thing into that, and you'll get back unity. So you'll get back X, the original variable. So I'm not going to go through all of that. But this is some probability theory. You might know that if I take F, inverse, and I generate it, and I evaluate it some uniform random number, then these things, the distribution of this, these are distributed. So if you're weak on transforms, get strong because that's going to only come up over and over and over again. And of course, if you want to lecture on um, why the inverse CDF um, thing works for transforming random variables, I can give you that lecture and review session. Um, this isn't the only way to generate random numbers. There's whole books on it, on how to generate random numbers. What's the downfall to using this technique, inverse CDF, for generating random numbers? Yeah. Okay. It may not exist. It might not exist. You might not be able to write down cumulative distribution in closed form, even though it does exist. You just can't write it down and use it. So something like a normal distribution. You can't integrate over a Gaussian function. You can't write down a formula for it. We always call it cap feet. So we know what it means it exists, but we can't write it down, so we can't use it. If we can't write down the cumulative, we can't write down the inverse function. Also, this only works in one-dimensional spaces. So we can only do it in 1D, and we can only do it in cases where we can write down the CDF and the inverse CDF. So not a very um, usable technique, but when you can use it, use it because it's quick. Um, for this function right here, I can do it really easily. That's why I use this function, so that we could see something that's kind of intuitive to us. Okay, so I'm generating six random numbers from that triangle. I'm sorting everything. Keep in mind I need all of those values so that I can sort it. If you leave one value out of this collection of six numbers, I can't tell you what the fifth thing is. I can't tell you what the order of everything is. I can't tell you even what the fifth biggest thing is until I see all six of them. And so the order stats themselves depend on everything. And so even though the original replicates are IID, the order stats are not IID. So I sort them, and then I'm just grabbing, you know, what I'm calling the J biggest thing, and I'm storing it. And then I'm going to plot a distribution of it. So I'll show you what that distribution looks like. Um, I also compute this probability. I look at out of all these values that I'm replicating 100 times, so I'm going back out into the distribution 100 times, collecting six samples, and then I'm seeing out of those 100 replicates, the fifth biggest thing, I'm checking to see which one, how many of them are less than one. And then I'm dividing by my replicate number. And I'm able to compute this probability. So let's just do it. Let's run this piece of code. Pretty straightforward. There it is. So there's my distribution of order stats. 
So there's 100 values represented in this histogram. And I can compute that probability, and the probability is zero. So I'm done, right? I've just answered the question. The probability of seeing, so all of my order stats, I never saw anything less than one. All of them were to the right of one. Looks like everything was bigger than 1.1. So yeah, you're right, the, the probability is small. It's not zero. So I just did this 100 times. Um, I could do it a lot more. So while I can't do this in reality and say, go collect me a whole bunch of data sets just like that, please do it 10,000 times for me, and then I'll give you the answer because I can plot your histogram for you. Um, we need math tools so that we don't have to do this, but it's still a fun way to check everything, kind of get a sense as to what's going on. And so I'll just crank up my replication number, and I'll run that again. And this starts to smooth out. I have now 10,000 things represented in this histogram. It looks like periodically some of them are to the left of one, very small number. And so if I'm trying to compute this probability, the problem with my simulation is that when the probability of something that you're computing is tiny, you need to crank up your replicates from really, really high to get a good sense of what that number is. And so when you're computing rare events, doing a simulation study like this is costly. If I were trying to answer the question, what's the probability that um, x, uh, let's say, 5 in this case was less than 1.7, I would have to do less replicates to understand that number. I'll think, let you think about relative errors, but it's all relative. So my number I just got was 0 0.0055, so maybe I report that. Uh, I would go crank this up really high. If I were doing this for somebody, I don't like 100 replicates. How big is big? I don't know. I'd like to see a lot of zeros after that. But I am storing a lot of stuff. This would cost me a lot. I could just keep track after each one, and I wouldn't have to waste so much storage. So I could code this up a little bit more efficiently, but who cares because it's 2021. So I've got RAM to burn. Let's do that again. So it'll take a while. Storing everything, it might exhaust the memory on this. Is he? There it is. You know, 20 years ago, you couldn't have, we would have been waiting for like a week. So that's kind of cool. And my number is 0.0046. I happen to know that's the correct number. So there might be a little bit of rounding here and there. We can check. So crank up N, I get the number. We want to be able to do this mathematically. So let's see what we need to do. So I'm just going to ask the problem, what's the probability that one thing is less than one? So basically, I need to consider these two scenarios. This is scenario one. Five things are less than one. And this is scenario two. So six things are less than one. If four things are less than one and two things are bigger, that's not an event that I'm computing the probability for. So there's only these two things that I need to think about. And so I need to just compute, if I want this, the probability that x5 is less than or equal to one, this is going to be equal to the probability of these two scenarios. So probability scenario one plus the probability of scenario. So in my simulation study, I'm just computing how many times things were less than one. I'm computing how many numbers, how many times I saw that in five by my replicate number. And it's approximating these probabilities for me. So all of those events that satisfy one or two are getting summed up in my little replicate counter. <clears throat> so how do we do this? Well, I just need to know, first of all, what's the probability that one of these things is less than one? And then I can start thinking about probabilities that two are less than one, or three is less than one, or four is less than one, or five is less than one, or six is less than one. We only need to think about two of those scenarios. 
And so the probability that each x is less than or equal to 1, that's just these little events over here being less than 1, this is just my cumulative. So between 0 and 1, 1 half x dx. So this is going to be 1 fourth x squared divided by evaluated between 0 and 1. So this is going to be 1 fourth. So that's my CDX. And that's specific to this random variable. So we haven't answered the question in terms of the order step. We've answered the question in terms of the IID replicates. But now we can start thinking about this scenario right here. These scenarios, once I have these probabilities computed, so how do I compute this? If I give you that, it's pretty easy. So I don't really care which one of these five things is less than one. I just care that there's five things less than one, and there's a whole bunch of different ways I could do that. So it could have been, you know, on the first three draws, those were things over here. This is the fourth draw, and that's the fifth and the sixth draw. So I don't really care which order it all happened in. And so all we need to do is think about this in terms of a um, binomial probability. So this is the probability that five things are less than one. And there's a lot of ways we can do that. And so I've got one fourth. It's going to be raised to the fifth. There's going to be five things less than one and three fourths. It's going to be my one thing over here. If you'd like, I can write that for the first power. I don't really care the order in which all of this occurred, and so I'm going to take out the order of everything. And that's going to be there's out of six things, five ways that I could choose to have these things less than one. So basically all I'm saying is I could permute these, shuffle them around, and there's five factorial ways of doing that. There's six factorial ways of shuffling the whole sample. And there's one factorial way that I can shuffle that point. There's not much I can do with it. So this is just a binomial probability calculation. So we've just kind of transformed thinking about this problem into a very simple problem of how many ways can I draw six numbers and have it so that five or less than one. So I'm just thinking about all of these events is a binomial, a Bernoulli indicator. Was it less than one? So what's the probability? It's one fourth that it's less than one. I've got five of those going on. If scenario one is true, and I can take out all the order like this. This, compute, this probability is pretty easy to compute as well. This is going to be 6 choose 6, 1 fourth to the 6, 3 fourths to 0. Otherwise known as 1 fourth to the 6. So I'm just going to add these two things together. And at the end of the day, this is 0 0.0046. You can check that. So that's the number that we computed for our simulation. So I'll let you plug in the numbers, and that's what we end up getting. But that's how we answer this question. What's the cumulative distribution for an order stack? Um, if I wanted to know the density function, I have to work a little bit harder at this. And so we just need to, instead of writing down a specific number right here, we just need to make that an argument. Write down whatever this. Um, these probabilities are in terms of that argument and to get the derivative of everything. And we'll do that in just a moment. So well, let's do it now. So more general. I think this is the question we originally wanted to answer. So what's the probability that x5 is less than some value? I'm going to call it y. That's just going to be a dummy argument. Why is it going to live between 0 and 2? So maybe we can write down an expression for this in general. Keep in mind, I'm going to have 
six things. So n is still six in my equation. So our cumulative distribution is x squared. Well, I'll, I'll evaluate it here since we're evaluating everything at y. At y, I'll keep in mind, this is the random variable cap x. This is just going to be y squared over 4. So that's my cumulative probability. And so to answer this right here, we just need to compute the probabilities of scenario 1 and 2. We're still studying the same problem, just slightly more generally. And so this is going to be 6, choose 5. This is going to be f of y raised to the fifth power times f of y. My original random variable, that's the CDF word. This is going to be 1 minus that. So the other probability, this is going to be raised to the first power. And then I'm going to add in, um, I'll just say y squared over 4, raise it to the sixth power. I'll get rid of all this stuff right here. That's a one funny way to write down one. That's a funny way to write down one. So that's my CDF in general. And I'm going to write this down like this. I'm going to call this f of cap x5, the fifth largest value. In my dummy argument that lives between 0 and 1, I'll just write that down. So this, just to distinguish one more time, this thing and that thing are totally different, and they describe totally different things. If you tell me what this is, I can answer this question and just write this thing down. Let's take a derivative of this. And I want you to see some interesting things that happen. There's a lot of cancellation in this derivative. So I just want you to get a sense of all these cancellations in what's happening. So our distribution, I'll just write it down one more time so I can watch. See it. This is going to be 6, choose 5, y squared over 4, raised to the fifth power, 1 minus y squared over 4, raised to the first power, plus y squared over 4 raised to the 6th power. So if I want to know this, the density function for this, so this is the histogram that I was creating in my simulation study, essentially, what that shape looks like. You can do this mathematically just by taking a derivative over this thing.
and then I'm going to take a derivative with respect to that. So this is pretty easy. So this is minus 2y over 4. Now I'm going to take the derivative with respect to this, and I'm going to add it. So this is going to be 6y squared, or 6y squared over 4. Decrement my exponent. And then I've got general 2y over 4. What I want you to see here is that there's an immediate cancellation. So you can verify, is this correct? It looks right. 9 a.m. Nobody can do a derivative. So hopefully I got this right. So I'll stare at it for a second. Uh -huh. That looks right. So um, notice that this thing and that thing are the same except for the sign right here. So this sign, this one has a plus right there. So this term is that term. And this is a funny way of writing down six. Six choose five, there's six ways of doing that. So you can check it out by plugging it into your formula. The five factorial cuts off a lot of those things in the six factorial, one factorial doesn't mean too much. So these are the same, so these cancel. And this happens all the time in these things. If we work this out more generally, um, I would have a lot more cancellations. I'll say something about that in a second. So this is my density function. And I'm going to write it out just a little bit differently. This is going to be 6 factorial over 5 factorial, 1 factorial, times 5. I'll simplify that in just a second. This right here looks like my CDF raised to the fourth power. This is another way of writing down my density function. This is one half y. That looks just like my density, and it's not a coincidence. So this is f y. And I'll be specific about these. These were my random variables. Cap x. And then this thing right here is 1 minus my CDF of my original random variable. Raise it to the first power. So I just want to point out that this right here looks like my order step minus one value, minus one. So this was my order step that we are looking at. My order step is five. This is not a coincidence that that's my order step number minus one. We also see that right here. So I'm going to cancel this right here. And I'm going to write this down as a four factorial. So my five kicks off that leading five in a five factorial. And so let me just show you what's happening in terms of the picture. I have my value. I'm going to call it y in all of this. And I have. Four things. This is going to be my fifth largest thing. And there's going to be a point over here. One thing. So I'm kind of thinking about this picture right here. Here's my distribution. That's between zero and two. This is my original distribution. And so I'm imagining my fifth largest thing happens at this point right here, y. That's what we're writing down when we write down this function. We're saying the fifth largest thing is over here, right there. 
And so I already know where that is. If this is my fifth largest thing, I've got four things to the left of it. And I have one thing to the right of it. That's what makes it the fifth largest thing. So what's the probability of all of these points being to the left of y? What's the probability that any point is in this interval right here? There's four things happening right here. What's the probability that I have any point over here? That's one minus cap fx. Now, I'm going to say this a little bit funny. What's the probability that a point lives right there? not quite to the left, but that's where I'm going. The answer is zero, right? So the probability of anything happening at a point, even though things do happen at points all the time, the probability of it happening a priori is zero. But if I estimated this in just a little small ball around here, minus epsilon plus epsilon, and I just had some little ball, I could talk about a probability of being in that ball. And if I take the absolute limit, the relative limit of this, and I shrink that ball down to almost zero, and I take that limit and I make it even further and further and further down, then I get in the limit, I get the density function. So it's that like instantaneous probability, it's not probability. So so that would be the calculus sort of argument that you'd butter up, is you construct this radius and then you take epsilon and drive it down towards zero. So if this were more rigorous, and they do things like this all over the internet, you can see these sort of versions of the proof. The proof in the book is a little bit more cumbersome. Um, the proof I'm giving you is very pictorial. And so, but if you wanted to do this and get it all right, you could use this epsilon ball and shrink it down. So, um, even though I said Bunker was not correct, he knew what I was going after, and he took us in that direction anyway. So this is not a probability, it's the density function of that happening. And so what do we get? We have how many things are to the left? It's four. So this is going to be my order of statistic minus one. That probability of seeing all that stuff, the probability of seeing one thing over to the right is this. The probability, the density, of that instantaneous point is just that. There's always just one of those that we're thinking about. And then I can take off my order right here. So I can reorder all of those points right here in four factorial ways. I can reorder all of these points, that one point, in one factorial way. Not too many choices. And there's n things that I can shuffle all together. And that's where this leading coefficient comes from. So let me show you more generally what happens. So let's just think about the joint J order statistic and take the five out of the, the conversation. So let's consider X J. So the J largest point. How do I figure out what the CDF is? I'll go back to calling this X, if you will. Because that's probably more conventional. It's the same binomial argument. So I'm going to look over the sum of a whole bunch of different scenarios. If I had picked x4 to work with and not x5, I would have had an extra scenario that I would have to account for. And they would keep getting added together. So in general, we're just summing i goes from j to n. And this is going to be n choose i, f, my original random variable, i, 1 minus f, x, n minus i. And I'm 
just adding together these scenarios. So how many scenarios are there? Well, j things have to live to the left of x, or j plus 1 things have to live to the left of x, or j plus 2 things have to live to the left of x. So it's just all of these various scenarios. So I'll write down a couple of them. So imagine I've got my little point x on all of these. So scenario 1. This is just going to be, there's j things. I'll say that this is the j biggest value. How many values are going to be over here? It's going to be n minus j values over here. So this would be a scenario where the j biggest thing is to the left of x. But I could have also done that with, I'm not actually counting right here. This is going to be my j biggest. This is going to be the j plus first, j plus one margin. How many things are over here? This is going to be n minus j minus one. Things over here. So that would be a scenario where um, the j largest thing is to the left of x. Just so happens to be this one. And I can consider this scenario right here, where there's n things over here and zero things over here. After I account for all the reordering of everything and I sum all those together, this is my CDF. When you take the derivative of this function right here, everything cancels. And you can try it for bigger examples. But it looks like once I take a derivative, this thing is going to be a mess. And it certainly would if you try to work it through it by hand. And everything in that derivative will cancel except for one of the terms, just like we did over here. And the formula that we'll get at the end of the day is something I can remember very easily because I can always remember this picture. So this is the thing that's harder for me to remember. I usually have to start drawing these pictures, and I usually don't compute this um, using this big sum anyway. I usually write down the density first. But let's just look at our illus this illustration. I'm going to have some value x. If I'm trying to consider what this is, my density for the j quarter statistic right here, I'm imagining that my j largest thing is right here. What that means is that there's j minus 1 things over the left of it. That's j minus 1 things. And there's going to be, how many things are over here? Can you help me out? n minus j. n minus j. So that's how many things are all in here. Just need to add these things up. 9 o'clock in the morning might be a little bit hard, but we just need to think about how many things are over here. We know how many there are. There's j things up to this point, but there's n minus j things over here. So Hunter's got the answer for us. So n minus j things over here. What's the probability of all of these points? They're at the x. The original random variable. The probability of this, 1 minus f of x, and the uh, not probability, but the instantaneous probability, if you will, the density function. So I could talk about the probability of a small ball and drive that ball down, and I would get the density function out of it. So this is happening with this instantaneous rate, you might say, the density function right there. So 
I don't care about the order of all of those, and I don't care about the order of all of those. It could happen in any particular way. So the probability of this picture, you might say, is n factorial. Well, I'll put in the, the common torus last. So this is going to be equal to f of x to the j minus 1 times this. I want that to happen as well. 1 minus f of x. This is going to happen with the n minus j right here. And then I need to take out all the order. So n factorial is the number of ways that I can permute everything. Now I want to think about all these things and the number of ways I can permute them because I don't really care to distinguish those. This is going to be j minus 1 factorial. There's only one way you can do this. I'll write it down in good line, one factorial. And then I'm going to have my n minus j factorial. Just make that a little bit clearer. Factorial, factorial, factorial. And I usually don't write down this one factorial. That's pertaining to the point that happens right there on x. And so this is my general equation for the density function of an order statistic. How do I remember it? I remember this picture that I draw. Next time I'm going to come in and I'm going to show you how to do this with two order statistics so that we can figure out its joint distribution. But hopefully that clarifies things for you so you don't need to memorize anything. You just need to remember what the picture is and why it kind of makes sense. So we're over by two, so I'm just going to leave it there. Recap with this next time I come in and then I'll start on the joint order statistics. And we'll probably do it for like three order statistics. So once you understand this picture, you can do it for any number of them. Okay, that's it for now, you guys. Thanks so much. And I hope you have a great week.